Good day, everyone. Welcome to Lubrication Experts uh, today. First of all, apologies for my video. <laughs> I've got a light broken down. And so you're going to have a very, very moody um, kind of cinematic uh, look to, to me for the moment. If you're on the audio podcast, obviously it doesn't matter. But today, got a very exciting discussion with Dr. Matthew Hobbs from EBT Clean Oil. Now, Dr. Hobbs is uh, the Manager of Technical Services, Research and Development at EBT Clean Oil. He has a huge wealth of knowledge. So if you've seen, uh, he's done all presentations, let's say, for example, in that sort of STLE forum, uh, as well as multiple webinars that I found really useful. So if you do have an opportunity to go to the EBT Clean Oil kind of YouTube channel, um, I'm sure there's some material from him up there, very clear and succinct way of explaining lubricant chemistry. And I've had a lot of people express interest in a sort of a more detailed view of lubricant chemistry and lubricant chemistry breakdown. And so that's specifically why I wanted to get Dr. Hobbs on today. So uh, Dr. Matthew Hobbs, welcome to Lubrication Experts. Well, thank you very much for having me and thanks for the, uh, the introduction there. Yeah, awesome. So we're just going to get straight into it. And um, one of the things I'd, I'd really like to ask you is that you have a lot of experience dealing and managing with uh, lubricant breakdown and the effects of lubricant breakdown, not just from a theoretical chemical standpoint, but also real world in the field. And maybe, you know, just to hit some low hanging fruit, what is maybe something that you would say most people don't appreciate about the breakdown of lubricants? Like what's something that is kind of a blind spot in our industry? Yeah, yeah, it's a, a great way to start. I oh, would like to start with the low hanging fruit. Um, the impact of oil breakdown and lubricant chemistry on equipment reliability, that is something that is really well understood. It's out there everywhere you look. Uh, you know, people talking about failures associated with oil breakdown. But despite, you know, how important of a topic this is, obviously, with respect to its impacts on reliability, Something that people don't understand is that oil breakdown is really an inevitability. It's, you know, it's something that can be mitigated and it's something you can be proactive about. It's something you can take steps to manage, um, but it is an inevitability. I mean, uh, we're, we're sitting here today and, uh, you know, regardless what side of the world you're tuning in from, uh, it's 21% oxygen thereabouts around you right now. And since oxidation is the primary breakdown pathway for lubricants, I mean, this is, like I said, an inevitability. Now, another thing that, you know, many people are kind of unaware of is despite the fact that oil breakdown and oxidation specifically are going to be inevitable processes that we're going to have to face. Unfortunately, most equipment maintenance programs and oil maintenance programs really don't do very much to address this oil breakdown. Uh, we tend to focus a lot of our, uh, our maintenance efforts on removing particles, removing dirt, keeping oils clean and dry, uh, but we don't focus a lot of effort in terms of managing their chemistry uh, and making sure that we can do things to prevent or mitigate the risk associated with oil breakdown. And, and like we mentioned off the top there, the low-hanging fruit uh, oil breakdown is, you know, is one of the leading causes of equipment downtime and failure. So it is a uh, a very significant topic. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it sort of speaks maybe to one of the wider trends that I've noticed, at least in the industry, having come into it relatively late, is the idea that most of the people that are managing, you know, rotating equipment assets tend to come from a mechanical background. So myself, I was an aerospace engineer, which is, I call it a glorified form of mechanical engineering. Um, you know, but everyone else comes from a sort of mechanical engineering background. Maybe they're a mechanic, fitter, turner. Uh, even people with reliability engineering roles tend to come from that sort of background. But so much of managing lubricants is about understanding chemistry. And there's very little knowledge or at least domain knowledge out there. I guess the overlap between mechanical engineering and chemistry is reasonably small. And most of us, you know, might've taken a single chemistry class during university and realistically our, our chemical knowledge is stunted at high school. So 
bridging that gap is something which is quite difficult to do and, and actually one of the reasons I wanted to 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 have you here but beyond just you know educating people is is there anything else that we can do to help people understand um that importance i education is definitely the key first step and i think one of the tricks is to try and overcome this perception of chemistry as this you know this scary beast that you know i didn't like that course in in freshman year and sophomore year or whatever it was i got that done at least um it, it really doesn't have to be this uh this this thing that uh, people build it up to be in their minds it's it's just the science of understanding you know what's going on and why why it's going on on a microscopic level so you know the the engineering mindset that you talked about that you know so many people that are managing rotating equipment etc these are engineers so they're used to looking at things through the lens of this macroscopic level and just not being afraid to look at it through the the lens of the microscopic level as well because same sort of cause and effect relationships you know, that dictate what an engineer looks at in terms of, you know, what he expects uh, to happen. It, it applies on a chemical level as well. So once you've got that base education there um, in terms of the chemistry, then it shouldn't be something that's so daunting. And then part of that falls to, you know, to, to chemists like myself too, to try and communicate things a little bit better, be a little less uh, intimidating in terms of the uh, the chemistry and the jargon that we use to try to break this down into into better everyday terms, so that people can really understand the importance of it. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. And and even it's funny that you say like at the macro and the micro level because I think people even do have some level of understanding at the microscopic level, but even then, it has a let's say mechanical bias. Like if you think if you think about filtration, everyone. Mm -hmm. Well, pretty much everyone is well aware in the turbo machinery world of the importance of filtration, something that's happening on the micron level. But because filtration of uh, physical particles is kind of a mechanical phenomenon, I think everyone can get their heads around that much easier than they can get around you know, targeting specific molecules that are being produced by the process of oxidation. So um, yeah, you make a really great point. Maybe that lends itself then to the obvious question, which is, you know, how do mineral oils, uh, and, you know, oxidize? So you know, what's the, the basic outline of the process? Yeah. Um, let's dive right in. Yeah. Uh, mineral oxidation. I'm sure, you know, there are entire university courses offered up on this. It's a complex process. So let's maybe start at the top, start at a higher level where it's more intuitive, you know, we talked about macroscopic versus microscopic. So macroscopic, what's going on when mineral oils oxidize? Well, we're changing the chemistry of the base oil. You know, we've got a hydrocarbon base oil in most instances. And when that hydrocarbon base oil oxidizes, we form oxidation products. Acids are kind of the most commonly discussed one, but there's a number of other species uh, that form. And on a macroscopic level, the things we need to understand about these acids and these other oil breakdown products is they're potentially harmful. I mean, acids intuitively, we know these are corrosive, so you don't necessarily want these, you know, in your equipment. Um, if you happen to be dealing with an insulating oil, acids are conductive. So, I mean, in a transformer application, for instance, you really want to make sure you're keeping that oil free of acids. You don't want it to be conductive. And another final and maybe most important point when it comes to rotating equipment is that, you know, acids and other oil breakdown products, they are more reactive than the base oil from which they formed. So, you know, if that base oil already underwent breakdown, it already reacted chemically, the acids that form from that breakdown, they're going to undergo even further reactions. And this is where breakdown tends to, you know, really start to become more complex you know, acids can react with, uh, with alcohols and they can form esters. We can have condensation reactions from various oxidation products. And at the end of the day, what these reactions tend to do is they tend to build bridges between these breakdown product molecules. They link them together so that we form oligomers and eventually polymers. And these higher molecular weight species, well, they become insoluble in the base oil itself. And this is when we start to see things like sludges forming and varnish deposits. And varnish is, of course, 
you know, a very hot topic in, in turbine applications, but uh, other applications as well. Yeah, that's, uh, that's I think, a, a great introduction. And maybe just to double click on the idea of acid formation. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that I think is a source of confusion when we're talking about the chemistry of the breakdown products is that when people talk about acids, it's difficult to conceptualize of acids in an oil-based system. So if I can, you know, cast my mind back to high school chemistry, everything was, let's say hydrochloric acid was HCl, and you had that tiny little subscript down the bottom, which had, you know, AQ for aqueous, the idea that acids were really only corrosive and they only, well, I said, I guess the term is dissociated into the hydrogen ions in the presence of water. And even when you look at, say, for example, the total acid number test, you know, we take the oil and I, th I think, what is it, glycol and isopropyl alcohol or something we mix it with? And then isopropyl alcohol and tell you with yeah. water so that we can get the acid formation. So what does it mean to have an acid in an oil system? Yeah, um, it basically means that you have something that's reactive in there. I mean, we we look at acidity in terms of the in terms of the reactivity that you know we've been taught that they exhibit in water in aqueous solution because this is what we learn in high school chemistry and what we learn about acids. Um, but that reactivity it extends you know beyond it's it's not limited to an aqueous application. It can occur in an or in an organic matrix, excuse me, like a base oil. Um, and that reactivity tends to drive a lot of these subsequent reactions that we talked about as being responsible for performing varnish, for forming sludges, and all of these breakdown products that ultimately impair the reliability of our systems. Yeah, okay. So one of the things that you talked about up the top was the inevitability of this reaction. You know, there's, there's oxygen all over the place. Um, so at some level, that oxygen is going to oxidize. Uh, oxygen going to oxidize. Gonna, um, yeah. But is there any kind of external uh, energy input that is required for that reaction to happen? Or will, will oxygen just oxidize any kind of base oil without the presence of some kind of energy to kind of give it a boost? Yeah. Uh, the answer is that there is an energy input required every chemical process has an energy input that's really required to get the ball rolling in terms of that uh, that chemical reaction and chemists call this the activation energy so an analogy would be you know if you've got your uh, your trailer parked at the top of uh, a big hill or a mountain or something like that and you've thrown a couple of you know wood blocks behind the tires to keep it from rolling down those wood blocks are your activation energy you know the, the chemical reaction is the trailer rolling downhill and you've got to overcome that wood block. So you got to push it just hard enough to tip it up over those wood blocks and get it rolling. And once it's rolling downhill, it is going to keep going. So when it comes to oxidation, there is an activation energy as well. It's a little bit complex when it comes to oxidation because there are so many different reactions that are involved in the breakdown process of, you know, hydrocarbons reacting with oxygen. This breakdown process proceeds via a free radical chain reaction. And that's a fancy way of saying that things go sideways in about a million different directions all at once. Oxygen itself is a di-radical molecule. So it can pull a hydrogen off of the hydrocarbon base oil. This generates an alkyl radical. And when I say, you know, radical, you know, there's, there's pop culture connotations to that, but from a chemistry perspective, it's not so good because radicals are extremely reactive and extremely unpredictable. They will basically run around and react with anything that they can find. So there's a little bit, you know, of an induction of, uh, you know, an activation energy to start this process. Once it starts, you form a multitude of different breakdown products. You have alkyl radicals, you have hydroxy radicals, you have alkoxy radicals, you have peroxy radicals. And one of the key things to understand about all of these different radicals is that they don't all have the same reactivity. So 
some of these radicals are extremely, extremely reactive. The lifetimes in the nanoseconds, they aren't there for long. Uh, but other radicals, they persist for longer in this process. So this actually provides us, when you get into the oxidation mechanism in more detail, you know, an opportunity to kind of step in at these key points in the free radical chain process uh, that is involved in oxidative breakdown of lube oils. You know, the, the radicals that are extremely reactive and they're just gone as soon as they form, essentially, you got no hope of stopping those. But some of the other ones um, are involved in slower steps where you might have a chance to step in and to prevent this from going in 10 different directions at once and breaking down further. Mm -hmm. When it comes to activation energy specifically, one of the things that's, that's key in oxidative breakdown is, you know, the formation of peroxides is commonplace when lube oils oxidize. And peroxides are a big deal because they're not radicals themselves, but they can split to form two extremely reactive radicals. So these peroxides, anything you can do to, to prevent them from splitting and forming these two extremely reactive radicals, is going to slow down the oxidative process significantly, hopefully make it not as autocatalytic as it tends to be. And that peroxide breaking and forming into two radicals, it does require a pretty significant energy input and activation energy to get that going. So this is where the impact of temperature on oil breakdown can really be felt. Uh, because, you know, if, if you have a higher temperature, you are giving, you know, peroxide radicals, for instance, the energy they need to get over that hump and to cleave into two different radicals, which are then going to go off in a million different directions and wreak havoc. Um, if you keep your temperatures low, you're much more likely that that peroxide is going to stay together and that it's not going to go off in a million directions. And we'll see, you know, I'm, I'm sure antioxidants are going to be part of the discussion we're talking about here when it comes to oil breakdown. You know, how antioxidants, the strategies we've used chemically to develop these really, you know, rely on interrupting things at these, at these peroxides at this key step here, where things slow down just enough. There's enough of a bottleneck in this runaway reaction that is oxidation, that at this bottleneck, things slow down enough that you can have an impact. Yeah, right. Now, I, I, I definitely want to ask you about antioxidants next. But yeah. just before we, we get into that, um, when you talk about uh, let's say, for example, temperature giving more energy to the system. Uh, just want to, you know, quickly zone in on that so everyone gets a, an understanding of of what exactly is meant by that. So, you know, temperature, I guess you could argue, is uh, kind of like a measure of the overall kinetic energy of the molecules in the system, right? So, as temperature increases, all of those molecules have more energy. So, uh, in terms of giving a system more energy to produce uh, more oxidation. Sometimes we think of, you know, heating a system up, so purely giving it more temperature. But are there other things as well that we can avoid, you know, things like microdieseling and ESD and all this kind of stuff that are methods of, of you know, putting energy into the system that would catalyze more oxidation? Absolutely. And it's some of those things that you mentioned there, like ESD and microdieseling, I mean, you're generating extreme temperatures when you have, you know, a sparking event or a micro dieseling event. So, I mean, that's, that's a whole ton of energy going in right then and there, you know, other things to consider is, is pressure that these fluids are under reactions are going to take place generally faster at higher pressures. So, I mean, if you've got a high pressure pump system, things are going to get degraded and broken down faster. And the reason for this is very similar to the reason that, you know, temperature impacts reactivity. You know, you, you mentioned the definition of temperature. It's the average kinetic energy, the energy of motion of the molecules. Well, when chemical reactions occur, it, it requires at least two different molecules to bump into each other and to basically bump into each other hard enough to make that reaction actually go. So this is the activation energy, hard enough. Um, you know, we're going to have more collisions and those collisions are going to be of sufficient energy to get the reaction going. When you're operating at high temperature, when you're operating at high pressure, when there are ESD or micro dieseling events, yeah, that's uh, that's that's really interesting. So now now we sort of come to antioxidants, uh, which is, I think, 
a topic that's a little bit cloaked in mystery for the average person who deals with lubricants because we hear that oxidation is this pernicious process that goes on in every lubricant system and there are these magic molecules inside lubricants called antioxidants and they help to slow down that process so could you please kind of illustrate um first of all how the antioxidants work and then while doing so help explain the limitations as well of antioxidants because the obvious question that i get asked all the time is well if antioxidants are able to uh, diminish the rate of oxidation why am i doing these ruler tests to measure their depletion why don't they just add more antioxidants into the finished lubricant to begin with so mm -hmm. that i don't i don't run out so yep. um maybe those two explanations would be would be helpful yeah absolutely i guess you know we'll start at the top we'll you know talk about antioxidants and how they work because that's kind of a obvious a very key part of understanding this process so basically there's two strategies that you know different antioxidants will employ to try and mitigate oxidation so there's there's one family of antioxidants that are referred to as radical scavengers so we got to remember oxidation is a free radical process when oxygen reacts with our base oil you know, it pulls off a hydrogen from the hydrocarbon and it generates an alkyl radical. That alkyl radical is reactive. It goes, you know, six ways from Sunday, Sunday and develops, you know, into a bunch of different kinds of radicals. Radical scavengers are chemicals that have been developed in order to try and remove these radicals, to react with them preferentially so that they don't continue to propagate. Propagation is one of the key steps in a free radical chain uh, reaction mechanism. And a radical scavenger essentially stops the propagation of the radical. It stops that radical from begetting further radicals. So when we talk about radical scavengers, we're most often referring to hindered phenols and aromatic amines. And I heard you mention the ruler test, linear sweep voltammetry. You know, this is the lab-based method that we can use to stay on top of what our amine and our phenol levels are so we can understand you know whether our antioxidant additive pack is intact or whether it is depleted so it's very important to be monitoring the levels of these antioxidants because another way of looking at them is they're they're sacrificial they are there to react with the oxygen or to react with the early steps of oxidative breakdown products these radicals they're there to take them out of the mix before that they can cause any harm. So you start with 100% amine and or phenol. And over time, as they do their jobs, they will deplete. And at a certain point, once you get to a kind of critical threshold where, you know, they, they've depleted, they will no longer be able to do their job nearly as well as they, they once did. Um, the industry standard is kind of to try and maintain your primary antioxidant at 25% or higher of its original levels. And the reason you need to do that is that, you know, once you're down to say 20% of your primary antioxidant, well, there's not a whole lot of it floating around anymore. And the likelihood of, you know, radicals that form from oxidative breakdown, that they're just less likely to bump into an antioxidant and more likely to bump into a base oil molecule, especially because there's a lot more of them. So at this critical threshold level of below 25%, you see oil breakdown starting to occur much, much more rapidly and the antioxidants become less effective. So this is, this is the importance of monitoring those antioxidants using LSV to, to ensure that you stay above those levels. Maybe just Why one clarification you... there, if you, don't, if you don't mind. So let's say, for example, I think people have a very strong conception of things like anti-wear additives, which have some level of affinity for the metal surfaces that they're trying to protect, right? And we do this through basically polarity of molecule, right? Um, you know, so, so the surfactant family uh, of, of additives are able to, I, I, I hesitate to use the word seek out because that implies some kind of animus uh, behind the molecule, but they're able to target the specific site. Now, with antioxidants and 
these radicals, is there any mechanism for them to attract each other? Or is it purely we're relying on chance for them to bump into each other? It's pure chance, but with a degree of engineering to that chance. And the engineering in terms of the chemistry, you know, comes in in making sure that, you know, the antioxidants actually react with these radicals much, much faster, much more readily than the radicals would react with, you know, with base oil molecules, that they would propagate the chain forward. Uh, so that's that's really the key there is that, you know, it, it, it is random chance in terms of what this radical is going to bump into. But if that radical reacts with an antioxidant 10 to the power of 10 times faster than it does a base oil molecule, then you're going to see great antioxidant performance from that. The base oil is really only going to be negligibly oxidized by, you know, any any chance encounters it has, whereas the antioxidant is going to is going to do its job. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Um, so then I guess that that obvious question comes up of why don't we just have more antioxidants? What's the what's the limitation there? So and this kind of comes into I like to look at this from the perspective of, you know, of a doctor prescribing some form of medication. Basically, any medicine, and in this instance, we're going to call it the antioxidants, the medicine, they're not a panacea. You know, nothing exists in a vacuum. There are always side effects to anything that we do. And in the case of antioxidants, you know, the issue is that the antioxidants themselves are not entirely benign. Antioxidants have been shown to form sludges and deposits, you know, when they break down on their own. So, the choice of, you know, what antioxidants to use and what concentrations to use them in, this is something that oil formulators have to be very careful with because they have to balance, you know, the positive impacts that these antioxidant molecules have, you know, against the potential harm, the potential negative impacts, the side effects, if you will, uh, that they could also have. So most oil formulations that, you know, we see on the market are the result, you know, of a great deal of R&D work basically behind the scenes. To, to play around with different antioxidants at different levels, in different combinations even, and to see where you really hit the sweet spot of, you know, maximizing the positive before there's any of these, these detrimental side effects coming into play. Mm, okay. Um, now that's a good segue into choosing a, a kind of an antioxidant system. So you mentioned before that you've got your phenols and your amines now at a very basic level, I understand those to operate more or less at lower versus higher temperatures. Uh, but you could maybe explain a little bit more detail there. But also uh, the peroxide decomposers, which, you know, the most famous one would be ZDDP, everyone's favorite anti-wear molecule. But um, maybe if you could explain like when you would choose to either include or not include something like that. Yeah. And thank you for getting me on track a little bit there, because I had mentioned that, you know, there's these two strategies when it comes to antioxidant formulation. Radical scavengers are the first. We talked about those, but the peroxide decomposers are the second. So I'm glad we got to come back, you know, up top to close out that, uh, that part of the discussion. So these peroxide decomposers, they operate on a different mechanism than the radical scavengers. They're not just going around mopping up radicals left, right, and center. But what they are doing is they are eliminating peroxides. And a little bit earlier on in this podcast, you know, we discussed how peroxides really represent an opportunity to, to step in and to stop autocatalytic breakdown when it comes to oxidation. Because the peroxides themselves are not radicals, but they can break themselves into two very reactive radicals, two reactive radicals that will like I said previously, they'll just wreak havoc once they've formed. So a peroxide decomposer, usually an organosulfur or an organophosphorus compound like a ZDDP, it functions by basically taking that peroxide and decomposing it into something inert. Usually this involves reaction with the sulfur or the phosphorus, uh, phosphorus excuse me, part of the molecule. And you get things like sulfides that are converted to sulfoxides, uh, phosphites that are converted to phosphates, et cetera. And when you do this, you essentially neutralize that peroxide. You form something like an alcohol instead, 
which is unable to undergo, you know, facile cleavage, facile splitting into two, uh, two um, radical components that are very reactive. And when you do this, you're just limiting the number of radicals that can exist in the system at any one time. And, and by doing that, you can slow down oxidation. Because again, the way that oxidation becomes auto autocatalytic and that it really gets out of hand is when we have radicals begetting radicals and these multiply, you know, especially with peroxides where you can form two species from one. Yeah. Uh, if you can cut that out of the equation right then and there, then you can slow the process down significantly. So... Wow. So going back to uh, the split between the phenols and the amines, because they you've you've described them both as being uh, you know radical scavengers. So on the surface, they appear to be targeting the same kinds of molecules. But are there any other distinctions that we should draw between those two? Uh, in general, uh, phenols are able to neutralize fewer radicals than aromatic amines. So th this is why aromatic amines have become very, very popular as antioxidant additives, because from a stoichiometric factor, they can take out four radicals, basically, whereas the phenols are limited to two. Um, so this is one of the distinctions between them. Uh, but, you know, that that isn't to say that a lubricant that contains, you know, an amine as its primary antioxidant is going to perform any better than one that has a phenol as its primary antioxidant. I mean, that's it's going to depend on the complex interplay, you know, of the base oil, of the additives themselves, of the additives antioxidant activity. And then again, those side effects that, you know, formulators have to consider, like whether or not that amine has any tendency to form sludges when it breaks down. Because obviously if that's the case, you might be better off with the phenol in that, in that instance. So... Everything has to be measured uh, experimentally and and sorted out. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Now, one of the I think the big um, trends, if you like, is that people are aware that um, different types of mineral oils, let's say, um, have different breakdown characteristics. So, the way that it's always been marketed to us is uh, that group threes. Well, as you go from one to three and even up to four, that the oxidation stability of the overall lubricant package uh, improves. Let's put it that way. So what is the relationship between the antioxidant system and the base oil that's used? The relationship between the antioxidant package and the actual base oil that's being used is again, everything has to work together. I mean, uh, we can look at base oils themselves. And, you know, a lot of people will say that, you know, group one oils actually have some inherent antioxidant activity all on their own. You know, this is because the solvent refining process that's, that's used with these fluids, it leaves behind aromatics and, you know, sulfur and phosphorus species that do have some antioxidant activity, but we're not putting a base oil alone into our equipment. So what we have to do is we have to look at the lubricant holistically uh, that that obviously includes additives, and those additives are there for a reason. Those additives are there to make the performance of the finished lubricant what we need it to be. Now, when it comes to you know antioxidant behavior in group one versus group two, three, four, the more highly refined oils, you know we see that these synthetic antioxidants that we add to systems they are much more effective at protecting the more highly refined base oils. They are much more effective than the natural antioxidants that might exist to some degree in, you know, older solvent refined group one oils. Uh, and more importantly, still from, from a chemistry perspective, the actual base oil, you know, when you get up to the more highly refined oils, you're dealing with, you know, with paraffins, with aliphatics that are, you know, saturated hydrocarbons. And these are inherently less reactive. They are inherently less prone to oxidation. So you also have that interplay of things as well. Uh, and the end result is that, you know, a group two or a group three oil is, is most certainly, or a group two or a group three lubricant, I should say, is most certainly going to outperform, you know, a group one product on the basis of its oxidative resistance. It's simply going to be much more robust. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So you just mentioned that group ones 
contain some level of inherent, let's say, antioxidants, uh, purely because they're not removed by the refining process, um, but that those are less effective than the ones that we would add as part of an additive system. So is the problem there that, let's say, for example, we had a, a radical that's floating around in a group one system, is the problem that it is kind of equally likely to encounter a, let's call it natural antioxidant versus one that's part of the additive package and the natural one is going to be less effective. And so the overall antioxidancy of the, the lubricant has reduced uh, because like we said before, we, you know, these reaction uh, mechanisms are one of uh, bumping into each other <laughs> for, to use the, the very technical term. So is that the problem with, uh, with, with group one oxidation stability? The real problem with group one oxidation stability is that the hydrocarbon base oil itself, there's a variety of unsaturated, you know, double bonds present there. These are obvious points of attack for not only oxygen, but, you know, a number of the, the breakdown products that result from oxidation as well. So, you know, even if there is some inherent antioxidant activity to a few of the, you know, the organosulfur species that are left floating around, that the solvent couldn't get out uh, of this group one oil. It, it really doesn't matter because the base oil is going to react, you know, perhaps by orders of magnitude, you know, more quickly when it, when it encounters radicals. Radicals are just going to, you know, cleave, you know, carbon hydrogen bonds much more easily in that group one oil. Um, than they would in the group two or group three products that are much more saturated. They don't have, you know, all of these all of these points of attack basically that uh, that double bonds represent. Yeah, cool. And and just to you know simplify it, I guess for the audience as well, if there was any confusion, so any kind of unsaturated bonds within a hydrocarbon are sort of like double or triple bonds yep. uh, between carbon molecules. Uh, sorry, between carbon atoms and um, the the refining process, which you probably hear about being hydrotreating or hydrocracking, is uh, you know a method that we use in refining to remove uh, those unsaturated bonds and and saturate them. Um, now, as we as we start to sort of uh, wrap up here, um, I think now is the is where we can get helpful for people. So now they understand all the processes behind it and everything that's in their lubricant to help protect it. So now, what are the methods that we can use to sort of uh, manage uh, that chemistry that's going on uh, and, and slow down the rate of oxidation and potentially even remove some of the byproducts? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the first and obvious things that, that we can do to try and limit the rate of oxidation is to maintain systems at lower temperatures, if possible. I mean, we talked about how much energy, you know, kinetic energy temperature is required to get these reactions started. And I mean, they're always going to occur. They're inevitable, but they occur faster the more energy you give a system. And there's, you know, there's a law that people, anyone that took freshman chem probably heard the Arrhenius law at some point, basically for, you know, every increase of 10 degrees Celsius, you're going to double the rate of reaction. And that includes oxidative reactions and the breakdown reactions that occur afterwards to generate sludges and varnish. So, I mean, if you have the opportunity to, you know, to operate your system at 10 degrees cooler than you currently are, you're going to have the rate of breakdown. And that's pretty significant. If you operate 20 degrees cooler, you're, you know, you're 25% of the rate of breakdown that you would have been initially. So this is a good first step. Other things that we can do to, you know, to mitigate the risk of oxidation. Well, let's try and keep the oxygen from reacting with our lubricants. It's a little bit tough, like I mentioned, under this oxygen atmosphere that is wonderful for breathing, but terrible for hydrocarbon base oils. But there are some things we can do. We can make sure that we maintain our lubricants so that they have you know, good foaming characteristics. They don't form foams. Uh, they have good air release properties. They don't hold air bubbles you know, in solution for longer. Because when you have foam and bubbles in your oil, you're providing a whole lot more surface and area for oxygen to get into the fluid. So if you can keep oils in good condition so that they're not overly exposed to oxygen like this, 
you know, you are a, a few steps forward in this battle against oxidation. You can be even more proactive than that. You know, we exist under, you know, an oxygen nitrogen atmosphere, but that does not mean that our oils have to. In, in a number of systems, it's possible to blanket your reservoir with an inert gas like nitrogen. Um, and when you do this, you know, you're eliminating one of the most common, one of the key contact points with oxygen. And, you know, you're going to have nitrogen dissolved in your system, potentially instead of oxygen, much, much less reactive. Uh, so, you know, there are products out there. EPT Clean Oil offers uh, a product in that vein. It converts, you know, it converts shop air into 98, 99% pure nitrogen gas, which is dry. We call it the TMRN2. Uh, and this and, uh, and other products that, that provide an inert atmosphere can just eliminate that touch point with oxidation, make it much less of an inevitability. Um, another thing that you can do in terms, of, in terms of oil maintenance to actually be a bit more proactive, like I said, right off the top, you know, our, our maintenance programs are unfortunately quite limited to particle removal and water removal. And it's really important to keep oils clean and dry. Uh, absolutely key there. Uh, but we're not paying a lot of attention to managing our lubricant chemistry. So if oxidation is an inevitability, you know, even under an inert atmosphere, there's going to be oxygen in the system at some point, there's going to be oxidation occurring and breakdown occurring at some point. If this breakdown is an inevitability, then why not bring in filtration systems that can actually effectively remove the breakdown products that lead to the formation of varnish that lead to all of these problems? And in this regard, you know, ion exchange resins have proven to be quite effective at varnish removal. At EPT Clean Oil, we're big advocates for our ICB ion exchange resins. We have specifically tailored these and engineered these for use in different lubricant applications so that, you know, you get selective removal of oil breakdown products, oxidation products, before they have an opportunity to lead to problems and to cause equipment related issues. I think the last thing that I'd advocate for, you know, in terms of mitigating the risks associated with oxidation, part of lubricant chemistry management is good oil analysis. You are blind to problems that you cannot see. And oil analysis is really your window into a lubricant's condition, into its chemistry. So you need to be running the right tests, you need to be running them the right way and at the right frequency so that you can actually get this good picture of your lubricant's condition. And all too often, you know, we see people that, that are doing oil analysis, but they're relying on, I like to call it the budget package from your local lab, you know, for anywhere between 15 and $40, you can get acid number and metals and viscosity, a particle count and water. And it's really important to be on top of all of these, but they're not really giving you much of a window into your lubricants chemistry. I mean, the acid number is to some degree, uh, but we have seen a number of instances with modern oil formulations uh, where, you know, acids aren't forming, but varnish still is. So it's really important to be running the right tests and I would advocate one of the most critical tests you can be running is the MPC varnish potential test. Um, because if varnish is causing most of the problems in your turbine, for instance, not acids, why are you routinely monitoring acid number if it's always staying the same at about 0.1, but you had a varnish related failure even at that level? Well, you, what you need to be doing is routinely monitoring varnish potential using the MPC test. You also should stay on top of your antioxidant additive levels, because as we've discussed, I mean, these are, you know, key sacrificial species that can help you to keep oxidation under control. You'd much rather these antioxidants be, you know, breaking down and oxidizing than your base oil, because it's not going to lead to problems. So in order to do that, you need to monitor them. You can do this using an RPVOT test. It gives you an idea of how much oxidative resistance your oil has left behind or linear sweep voltammetry, commonly known as ruler. You know, you can look at your antioxidant levels that way as well. Because part of lubricant chemistry management isn't just removing oil breakdown products as they form and actually addressing that problem, but it's making sure that your lubricant's chemistry can actually manage itself still, that there are antioxidants left and that that oil 
you know, is, is basically fit for continued use under our oxygen atmosphere. Yeah, interesting. Uh, and that's so good that there are some um, really good strategies uh, that, that we can use and take into the field, right, to help um, with, with this issue. Because like you said, you know, it's going to happen to every oil system. Um, as we wrap up here, I always like to ask a question about the future and, and what kind of what's on the horizon and uh, beyond the technologies that you've already discussed. Is there anything that you kind of view, whether it's a, a specific technology or best practice that you could see on the future, uh, which might be about to be adopted, which could help people uh, with this issue? I think the real, you know, the, the real leap here is the extension of this discussion uh, that relates to the importance of oxidative breakdown and, and varnish and how that impacts equipment reliability. Right now, everyone talks about this, you know, in gas turbine applications and, and compressors. Uh, but, you know, we see varnish all over the place in many, many different applications and in many different kinds of oils in, in group five synthetics that aren't even hydrocarbon based oils. So I think the real next leap here is the extension of what we've learned, you know, with our turbine and our compressor oils into different fluid types and, you know, how we can, how we can tailor uh, technologies like ion exchange in order to remove varnish and to manage the chemistry of these lubricants uh, as well, because it's, it's a very narrow, uh, it, it the problem of varnish when viewed only through the lens of gas turbines or compressors is, is incredibly narrow, but it's, it's a much more pervasive issue than people realize. And part of the issue associated with that is that, you know, people are blind to what they're not seeing. So if they're not running tests like the MPC test and evaluating their fluids varnish potential, then, well, you don't know what you don't know until the equipment fails. Yeah, that's, uh, that's so interesting. Well, um, Dr. Matthew Hobbs, thank you for such a, you know, articulate and and very succinct uh, explanation of oxidation breakdown in lubricants, how to manage uh, those those breakdown products, uh, and some strategies that we can take into the field as well. I think that's uh, some really good insights that I think a lot of people will be able to pick up on. So, really appreciate your time today, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll definitely talk again soon. Well, thank you very much for having me.